So let me set the stage for you. Set it. Um, Typically, when we do the On The Tape podcast, I see Danny Moses. Sometimes I see him in person. Sometimes I see him through the computer. Yeah. That's a video, they call that. And he usually has in front of him reams of notes, copious notes. I walk into our studio today. Danny is IRL. They call that in real life. (laughs) And will be very soon for months on end. Yes. He summers in... This area is that yeah, what people well, say? You well, are, you know, and, all I know is on, I the, leave. on the on the Tony on the Tony Beach coast. All I know of, is this: Ca- Connecticut. No, yeah, I left figuratively, literally, a path of destruction. Did you see the rain in Fort Lauderdale? <laughs> I took off from Fort Lauderdale Airport two days ago. You know, I don't have great luck with the flying. Oh, no. Twenty-five inches of rain in that's, one day. That's it. No, that's 20 impossible. Five inches of rain. My car's gone. At, that's fine. I don't really care. I don't, I'm going to stay up Floating here for good. No, there's nothing left. Yeah, 25 inches of rain. Anyway, continue. Well, you're here. I'm here. And By guys the way, recognize the fact that no, we... But I want to set yeah. this up. By the way, yeah, you are. this <laughs> is the On The Tape podcast. I am Guy Adami. The aforementioned Danny Moses. I'm going to be IRL. off the tape all day. I'm going to be off. I'm just letting you know right okay, now. Okay, no, that's fine. I am, it's not even tweaked. It's just disjointed. So this is Thursday. It's 3.20. Yeah. We're, we're going into the close. And Dan Nathan. Yeah, hi. Okay. Um, and, and Danny's going to be on with us on Fast Money in about yeah, an hour not, and a half. I better get be my amazing. shit together. I better get my really? shit together. Are you a little nervous? So, no, I could go off the rails, actually. Really? Oh, which yes. oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just explain <laughs> what's going on here with the aforementioned <laughs> Danny Moses. As I mentioned, he typically has reams of notes. So I walk in here today, Nothing. and he's sitting at the table by himself. He looked like Don Finucci from Godfather <laughs> Two. He's drinking an espresso, and he's got this. Oh, little the beginning pad. of the wedding in the out no, in t- that's in- Godfather One. Don uh, Finucci is the black hand. Godfather Two. If oh, you yeah, recall, yeah. he asked Robert De Niro to come see him. De Niro is going to give him some money. He's yeah. drinking his espresso. That's Danny Moses here, and I'm looking at this pad of paper, and it's got basically a little header. It says. Pros and cons. What does that say? This I, is says rate cut. You're, you're there's only cons. There's yeah, only no. Cons. I have. I. It's the same thing I wrote on pro and con. It's a rate cut in September is a pro and a con because if you're cutting in September, it's a it's shit is breaking. Right. Like there's no way. And then my pro is inflation's coming down. My con is inflation's coming right. down. And inflation's coming down because things are slowing down. So I can't come up with any reason. And I'm not upset that the market's rallying again. That it's 4140 now as we sit here right. approaching the. Year high of forty one eighty, which I don't think we. I still believe I'm going to stand firm that we probably won't get there. But tomorrow's going to be no question. I said it earlier in the week on our market call. This is the most important earnings that we've had in I think thirteen years. To so, be honest so with you. Don Finucci, that was standing. I think that was uh, Gaston Moskin. I believe it was his name. How I mean, do you that's do a this? great poll by me. That's nineteen seven. And this uh, for those people we are in real life. I always thought when I'm down in Florida taping on the camera, the guy has something in front of him. There is nothing in front There's of him. There's never anything. Where so you wait, pulled that from? Wait, wait, who's the, wait, but, but Godfather one. So I just conflated the two. Yeah, and I'm sorry about that. But but the guy who's like reading the notes, he's waiting to go see Don Corleone. No, that, no. That's, but, but that's also what Danny might be he, doing well, before might Fast be. Money. By the way, yeah. I can't think of his name, but that's your Luca Brasi. Yeah. That's Luca yeah. Brasi. Yeah. That Danny is not Swims Luca Brasi. With the I'm going to jump in the Hudson River. All right. So 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 all right. So you're. Apoplectic is, is it's not even right. apoplectic. No, I am. Just you yeah. know, let's just think about what we had this week. We had CPI, we had Fed minutes, we had PPI. Markets partying right okay, now. Okay, so CPI, yeah. by the way, still five percent. Fine, yeah, it's coming down. Cut, yes, know. it is. We all thought it would come down. Yeah. It still has a five handle. Yep. number one. You know what else has a five handle? Fed funds. Thank you. That's an excellent. Oh, job. is that what you were going to no, do? No, 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 no. So what, I, no, I so, appreciate so we got, that. We got fives. We got we got double fives. We got double nickels as they as they sure say they in the say business. That. You know okay. what that is. What is it? In craps? What? Hard 10. You know what else they call that when you're sk- sitting at the uh, They table? don't call it boxcars. They call it a big dick. Pardon me? What? Right, I don't so know just, you know, yeah. wait, are we going to turn into the all-in podcast right now? Why is that? Oh, oh that's right. I don't want to. I don't want to. You want to go there? What, no, is, I don't want what is the all-in podcast? That's the, uh, well, first of all, it's Chamath. It's, uh, it's You know what a hard the, six the is in craps? Uh, yeah. It's a Brooklyn forest. Yeah. Two trees. You know what you know what a hard four Two is? Trees. Yeah. You're bringing okay. back the wide bush. It's yes. a little it's a little Joe. Yeah. That's a hard that's right. four. That's right. All right. So we were already off the rails. We're only a few minutes. No, in. I so we had the CPI, we had the PPI, we had the Fed minutes, and tomorrow morning we have the all important, we have the bank earnings bank that are gonna earnings. get kicked off. So by the time people are listening to this, good chance banks yeah. have reported. But let me just say this quickly. And Danny, <laughs> you might have views. I'm sure you have views. I have posited, which is a term I often use, that CPI is a gauge of inflation. Yet PPI is a gauge of the economy. So this, to me, sets up exactly the situation, the scenario that you've been talking about. We still have very high inflation in the form of CPI, 
But right before our feet, underneath our feet, the economy is breaking down in the form of PPI. That number was an unmitigated disaster. And when you couple that with the ISM numbers we've seen, things are happening extraordinarily so quickly. is the economic ground moving below our feet? And to Danny's point, if Fed cuts are being priced in right now for the fall, that would mean that the economy is doing something that really won't be supportive of S&P earnings? Is yes, that what's Dan, going I on? I think that's it. And to say it's north of... Wow. To, we'd be, and we effectively, I believe... That's your, that's your come to the center stage voice. Yeah. Can you say that? Let's I'm welcome missing. PPI, CPI front stage. Well, let's get your calendars. I know it's April, but, but the Fed's coming up in May. But you've been saying yeah. this for a while, Danny, though, that at some point the Fed is going to be off the table, right? So we hit this I think kind it's of now. 5%. I actually yeah. think it's yeah. right now. But actually, May 3rd is the next meeting. No, I think yeah. we, I think we are going to transition... Tomorrow, the transition begins with the earnings from the banks. Yeah. And because we've already solidified these rate hikes. And if it's 25 bips more and done, so be it. But the damage, if you want to call it, has been done. And let's see. Now I think it's going to focus on real economy. Because to the banks, they've, had, they've, they've already basically taken the pain, for the most part, mm -hmm. in terms of switching deposits around within a bank, right? Interest bearing to not non-interest bearing to interest bearing, right? And that hurts the bank's margin. It hurts your net, inter net interest income. I I agree with it. What's but, interesting about that, and I want you to continue that thought. Yeah. So, yes, I do believe that's true. A lot of these banks have taken the pain. Sheila Baer came on CNBC's Fast Money, I think, earlier this week or last week. I apologize. She thinks, which I do as well, there are more to come in terms of the banks. Warren Buffett, who everybody bows at the altar of, suggested in Tokyo with Becky Quick that he sees – other banks going down the same road. So they might have taken the pipe, as they say, but there's more to Here. come in terms right. of this movie. So for 13 years, we've had a Fed put, right? Yes. Okay. So for the last six weeks, we have a Treasury put or an FDIC put, mm -hmm. right? We know if there's another large bank that's in trouble, the next move by Yellen and the Fed is to guarantee all deposits. It is. Let's not kid ourselves. That will be the move. That's already, I believe, built into the market. So now it becomes... Forget about a bank surviving what they can do. What is the bank worth? What are their earnings look mm -hmm. like? What's the return on equity, their ROE, right? What's their book value? Does it matter? And I think we're about to shift from cataclysmic or banks going out of business to, okay, well, the Wall Street banks have very little IPOs and M&A, right, right, activity. The commercial real estate loans, which matter a lot to the regionals, right, which are on the, on the books, is not going to get any better. The CNI loan, commercial, and industrial loan books only have one direction to go. This is, it's, not, it's not horrible. And then- consumer credit. It's going to get worse. So are these companies? So now I believe we're going to transition from the banks are all going out of business to, okay, the banks are going to manage through it, but what are they worth? And that's the beginning, I believe, of the fundamental bottom-up analysis and stock picking. And I'll go even one step further than that. The biggest thing to me is the reset of credit over the next, call it one to three years, right? The zombie companies that never should have even gotten a piece of paper that they got that we've talked about that are coming up for refinancing that are coming. A lot of companies, so the way we call it a stock picker's market, it's going to be a bond picker's mm -hmm. market. When I say bonds, I'm talking credit, everything across fixed income, right? It's, so people are going to start to look at companies that way, and it's going to be different. And I think that lost art is coming back to a theater. Well, and senior uh, and so, you know, it's funny, yeah. though. You know, I, I was actually in an Uber the other day, and the, and the guy is a Fast Money fan. He's, he loves Guy Dami. I'm probably his least favorite Fast Money That's trader. No, it happens. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. He used this expression, and I loved hearing it from it. He's like, listen, this market's really hard. I'm waiting for it to come back down. I want to kind of buy some stocks. He's like, you know, two years ago, you could have thrown a dart and made money. And, and that psychology, I think, is one of the reasons why this year, out of the gate, we just started getting off. People were just done being bearish, right? They wanted to buy things again. And so I, I'm less um, – I actually think, Danny, before it becomes a stock picker's market again, we need to actually have a big flush in the market. Okay? No, I agree. Like, so, like, there needs to be some fear placed at it because right now, again, you know, we have a VIX that's trading – 18. Okay, it's actually below 18 mm -hmm. right now. It's 17.95. And that's just speaking to the and even the move index which we've quoted on yeah. numerous occasions bond the volatility. spread between the bond volatility and the equity volatility, that is actually compressing because the bond volatility is coming in. All that being said, some of the moves when that CPI print came out, that was in line, okay? That was in line on Wednesday morning. The 2-year yield went from 4.07 to 3.87 in a straight line. Equity futures ripped, and now we're seeing the move index, we're seeing that come in despite the fact that the volatility bands in the Treasury market have actually widened over the last couple of weeks, despite the fact that we've seen some of the equity measures moderate. We've seen the KRE kind of, you know, this is a regional banking index. We've seen Schwab. We've seen these things kind of settle down, at least from a volatility standpoint. So we're seeing bond volatility come in. 
equity volatility melt, that's a really nasty setup. So to me, I don't think you can start picking stocks again until we see that multiple compress, the thing that we saw expand for no good reason over the last few months. Fed minutes only reinforce what we saw on the dot plot and in the press conference. So I love when the, they pull, you know, the algos will pull something like, oh, they're predicting a mild recession. So that's a positive because the Fed's going to stop sooner. But this market is not priced for that, obviously, at all. And Dan, when I say stock picking, again, keep in mind, and this has been going on all year, this chase. If you're a long-only mutual fund manager managing billions of dollars, you have to allocate. You can't stay in cash. Yep. So you have to pick stocks within various sectors. And I believe that you know the large banks that are the safe ones are obviously going to – the same way we've seen in tech, right? Just There's safety in numbers, and the people feel like, oh, I'm not going to get – blown up in some of these names. I think banks will do that as well. And I think we're going to go through a shuffle of money moving around within that sector. And I think we're going to get a very clear picture. So when I say stock picking, I'm conjoining that with the market probably coming down and then yeah. picking up what you want to purchase within that. Well, sector. just large banks would be a great example of that. Because again, by the time you're listening to this, you're going to already know what JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citibank, and, and maybe a cup PNC, I think is out tomorrow morning. And if there are any issues, like, you know, like think about a year ago, JP Morgan got nailed. It was one of the first banks to start getting hit because the expenses were going up faster, right, than revenues. And we know that like a lot of like the focus on net interest margins, the those financial activities and in investment banking was falling off a cliff and that sort of stuff. So like, might there be some really good opportunities on valuation? I'll just say this. Yeah, but pro from lower levels. I mean, mm -hmm. JP Morgan's only down 10 or so percent if there's any issues. But if the if they're basically the reports are there no big issues, but they still remain cautious, are you going out there and buying the banks? Like, I don't think so at this point. I mean, like, I, I don't know, guy. I mean, like, is that something that you want to do? Not in this environment. As I said, and I don't, I'm not suggesting I'm right, but the interest rates could go back to zero. But credit, you know, credit standards credit tightness is going not only remain, but it's going to get worse. So there's going to be less credit around. Banks' ability to make money in this environment, I think, goes lower. And the multiple you pay for banks, by definition, should go down. So this whole price-to-book thing, you have to start asking yourself, what is the proper book value in this environment for a lot of these stocks? I would submit, and I'm fascinated by this, I think there's a really good chance that you start seeing book value go down, trend lower when these companies report earnings. So... JP Morgan trades right now 1.8 times tangible book value, mm -hmm. which is really what you should use, mm -hmm. right? The worst it got in the crisis was down to one times, roughly. It may have gone under a bit, but that's kind of where it Wait, went during the, the financial GFC, crisis. Yeah. 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 And so 1.8 is not crazy high as long as you're earning some type of ROE off of it. I look at Morgan Stanley, which is trading north of two times book, right? And I look at their businesses. They're exposed in a lot of different places. They're exposed on the private client side of people buying treasuries and moving them out of their checking account, so to speak, on the high net worth area, right? They're exposed on the IPO calendar, mm -hmm. on M&A. That one's hard to kind of, I would not be long that. I'm not saying you have to go out and run yeah. and short that. But to me, there are very sensitive, both Wall Street sensitivity and economic sensitivity. And then they have, the, obviously, the retail brokerage arm as well, that to me are pretty vulnerable. Am I going and buying a Morgan Stanley here at two times book? No, I don't I'm, I'm not so going to do it. I'd rather own Goldman at one point two times tangible book than a, than a, so you have all these pairs trades set up people, you know, long something, short something within the group. That's kind of how these people, but let me say this about the banks and people are like, Oh, you banks, the banks are the driver of the entire economy that the, the system is financialized. It's the most important sector that there is. They have been the ones that have driven this thing. Money's been free. They've been giving loans to everybody. Well, they're pulling that in now. And that's what I meant when I said yeah. are the same companies that were able to get credit, right? Price at a ridiculously low price at a tight spread, two years ago, going to be able to come around again? The answer is no. no. So what does that look like? It means that the banks are going to be fine, but they're not. So their loan growth slows down. Mm -hmm. And so so anyway, we could go on and on, but I think this is really important. And I know I always say Qs, Ks, read all this stuff. <laughs> These are Qs because they're quarters that are going to get reported. Read through them if you want to learn uh, you know, about what's happening in credit. And are these companies the consumer-facing banks, the so Wells Fargo Bank America's? reserved appropriately for maybe may coming. Real quickly on banks, um, Jim Bianco, Bianco Research, sure. who often comes on uh, Fast Money, and hopefully he's going to join us soon. I think JB. AD is efforting it um, for the podcast. That's he Amanda had, Diaz. Yes, it is. He had a tweet thread out this morning talking about the uh, – here, here, this is great. We'll put it in the show notes. Here are the last 15 years of total return performance, the S&P 500, um, and it's 11 sectors. Um, and he's really talking about um, the blue is the largest industry within the financials, the banks. Dividends included, they have barely returned 
returned more than 0% over the last half a generation, way behind everybody else. Mm -hmm. So when you see like a, a data like that, and we'll put it, you can see it for yourself, and you see it versus the other sectors, you say to yourself, we're sitting here now in the wake of this mini financial crisis that we had among regionals. We have no idea how this plays out over the course of this year, especially to your point about if there are defaults in credit. And, and you know what I mean? Like if you think about what a, a, a recession, even a soft landing recession might do, these banks, they're just not interesting. They're only interesting if you think the economy is inflecting the way the NASDAQ is kind of telling us right now. At least I don't buy it. You guys don't buy it. The NASDAQ's telling you something different because right now the NDX, the NASDAQ 100 is up 20% on the year after being down 33% or something like that. It feels like we're out of the woods. And I just want to make one last point as we think about we get by the bank earnings in about a week from now, right? And then we're going to be focused on these large technology companies and we're going to be, you know, industrials and, and the like. And we've already had, and maybe you have two cents on this, is what the airlines had to say because mm -hmm. people are really optimistic into the summer season. And you saw what American and Delta had to say. No bueno. But here is, this is um, from our main man, you know him, Butters, John Butters over there. JB. At fact, JB. At fact Butter, set. Hashtag Butters. Hashtag Butters. Um, he's the senior earnings insight analyst over here. But S&P is expected to report year-over-year -year earnings declines of 6.8% for Q1 2023, which would be the largest decline since Q2 of 2020. Um, they were down 32% that year, but that was in the throes of the um, pandemic, and we did not know what was going on. And one of the things I think is really interesting about this is that we've seen this over the course of the last year, that over the course of the quarter, we've seen estimates come down, right? And so now we have a situation where we're going to have the largest decrease, almost 7% expected. Who knows if it's better or worse? But when you finally, let's say if you're one of these companies and you start reporting better, do you get rewarded for that, Danny? Like that's kind of the point because a lot of the hard work has already been done with low expectations. Yeah. I think the like I said, I think things will start to separate now. Survival of the fittest. Cameron Dawson, as I said on Monday, had a great note out last Friday talking about that exact thing. It's yeah. like earnings are going to be down for the S&P. You've already had 106 companies of the 500 are already guided down, already going into this. So you will have some companies that will beat expectations. But I have another axe to grind oh, here. I like, oh, I like that. So this whole this, talk you're about— You're looking at me when you say that. <laughs> I don't, I just, this whole talk about mild recession, major— let me let me say, hold on. I, I, I please, because I got some thoughts <laughs> on this too. People forget what it actually feels like yeah. to go through, and it feels now we've had this kind of rolling recession has occurred in various, but nothing significant, right? But you're starting to see on the industrial side things are slowing down, backlogs are draining. Yes, orders are are coming in, but things are slowing down, right? The delta is slowing down on orders, and so when that happens, and when that comes in on the top of the job cuts, we've already started to see in tech land, and it's all kind of coming together, right? I don't think people. I, I think they're fantasizing if they think we're going to get to that point. The way how fickle this market is and how people react to every data point, and every, they're going to overreact to the downside when it's very clear that the wheels are in motion and no one's they'll beg of the Fed, but it won't matter mm -hmm. at that point because this is 13 years, I say it again, of an unwind. It just doesn't fix itself. And again, let's talk about QE and QT, which I haven't looked at the most recent, uh, maybe Dan, while I'm looking at this, can look at what the Fed balance sheet registered you know, in the last 24 hours, it's probably still on 8.5, $8.6 trillion. I still believe that we're kind of done there with this quantitative tightening. So that'll be the one of the arms, I think, that the it's Fed can pull. Done out. before we even started. Yeah. And it's interesting, in terms of the Fed minutes that came out, great Tom Petty album. I think you're a Petty person. I love Petty. Damn the Games torpedoes, if you recall. Of course. I mean, that's actually from a true saying, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Are like, you doing free falling right now? Are you no, I, and I'm not going to do that. What okay. I was going to say was, if you listen to what these cats said, they're like, we acknowledge that what's going on in the banking arena, given the, given the fallout from Silicon Valley and some of these other banks, will probably cause a mild recession. That's what they said. But they hiked by 25 basis points anyway last meeting. And my point in saying that is, they realize what they're about to do. They're telling people what's going to happen. The market's choosing not to, at 4150, the S&P is choosing not to listen. Now, I'll also say this. I have no idea what generates buy orders or stuff. We've talked about passive investing forever. This environment is really scary. The fact that stocks are moving like they are. We had an Apple headline. I understand that PCs are not a big part of Apple. I totally get it. Down 40%. Four zero percent. I think the range for most companies was anywhere from twenty to thirty percent. So Apple was obviously lagging yeah. their peers. It's a smartphone company. I get it. There was a Microsoft note out earlier this week by an analyst. They said, "Guess what? Their cloud is going to slow." Didn't seem to matter. So you have all these people trying to warn you. 
The stock market is saying we don't care. Damn the torpedoes, Danny. Full speed ahead. I was going to do a petty because I was. Do there's it. There's a lot of in there. Do it. No. I yeah. can't. I, I'm going to do it in you a few what, minutes. He's not feeling yeah. it. So, so yeah. real quickly on the Fed balance yeah, sheet, got? Um, got down to eight three five trillion. That's what it's. I know that people. was once. That no, was no, a, no. Well, I'm just keep listen, going. But, it, but but Danny, in a month, it's gone from eight three five to eight seven. Yeah. Okay, it's like, back to eight seven yeah, again. Eight six five or something. Yeah, yeah but, so it hasn't but, moved in the last but, week. I know, but my yeah. you you get my point yeah. here. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to say really quickly. Listen, I actually think. The Fed is going to raise May 3rd by 25 basis points because you made this point, I think, yesterday on Fast Money. I mean, the unemployment rate ticked down, right? It's at 3.5%. And I think that's the thing that they're still a bit worried about in, in wage no you know, stickiness. Okay, but again, we can debate that. What I think is really interesting about the first week of May is that meetings on May 3rd, but we have the all-important April jobs report on May 5. You know yeah. what I mean? So, like, that's going to – and Cinco de Mayo. You got anything for Cinco de Mayo? Kentucky Derby. Oh, is sorry. Right, but, but I figured, yeah. like, you got something there. Yeah, like, with keep the, going. With the Cinco. Okay. So that, that's going to be a really interesting week. And then I think the Fed is – then we're done with the Fed, right? Like, then we're really drilling down. Well, let me turn it on you. What if the Fed doesn't go on May 3rd? What happened we in these two weeks? No. Now, <laughs> what happened in these next two weeks coming up that would well, cause I don't know. the Fed I mean, not – no, I'm serious, not to go. And – Again, I'm so done with the Fed. It's so well. Let you me know. ask you this: What if what if um, earnings that we get until that point? I think Apple reports on May fourth um, or May third or May fourth. What if uh, like all the earnings look pretty good? What if it makes it feel like? And listen, if you're looking at the stock market and yeah. you're looking at what all these companies said, and you're the Fed, right? You're trying to kind of still slow things down a bit. You stay the course, you know. So if there's no disasters, and that was my point about expectations, they've come down. Stocks have gone up. If stocks don't sell off on in line to worse news, then we're off to the races, you know? And we've been tracking the charts in the S&P and the NASDAQ. They're like, the s and is at that downtrend going back to January of uh, 2022. Mm-hmm. The NASDAQ is is at a level, at least the 100, at a level where it, it could fail right here or it could break so, so out. Let, and so, Dan, the races. just to put this back since yeah. you're the options guy. Yeah. Vol, you just said how cheap Vol is. Yeah. Buying a straddle here for those people out that are looking seems to be what Dan is saying. He could off to the no, races. No, I, I, oh, I never not? suggest straddles. I mean, like okay. I, I, I like I think like for our listeners and for most people out there, the well, idea just of a buying situ- volatility, like like just pure vol, like we could go one way or the other. It's just not. All a right, you just trade. described a situation. I'm saying no. We're what, at the moment. what I described a situation is that if you're long stocks and you don't want to sell, but you're kind of worried the idea of you're getting long vol if you were to buy an S&P put. Listen, Carter like, like had his chart up saying? this week, right? You've yeah. seen a couple of them. Mm-hmm. We are literally, the, the wall is closed. We're going to pick a direction here. And that's why I keep saying this is the inflection. And let's see what happens with the earnings. And listen, Dan, if the earnings are smooth and things are settling in a little bit and the outlooks are good, there's no reason the market can't make new highs for the year. And I don't think that'll happen, but it's certainly possible. Yeah, let me just give you a little. um, So right now, if we look at May 5th, okay, Mm -hmm. so that's that Friday jobs report. And if I'm looking at the SPY, that's the ETF that tracks the S&P 500, it's trading about 413. If you were to take the 413 put and call on May 5th expiration, okay, that's a weekly expiration. If you put the two of them together, Danny, you get your straddle, which is about $13. $13. That's okay? a lot. So, so well, $13. That's a 3% and, move in either direction. Okay, basically. but like, that's 6%. a lot. For, you know what no, I'm no. I, I'm well, saying, what I'm saying is between now and then, I'm telling you, vol is cheap as chips. So if you wanted to protect your portfolio right now and it maps to the S&P 500 and you were worried about the Fed meeting on May 3rd and you're worried about earnings that are going to go on between now and then and then you're worried about that jobs report, if you wanted to buy an at-the-money put, In the S&P 500, the 413 put on May 5th expiration costs less than $6. That's like less than 2%. That is as cheap as it gets, people. I mean, so if you want to YOLO, if you want to, like, make any – place your bets, people. That's all I'm saying there. Get all up in there because we are going to move more than 3.5% in either direction between now and – and so I, so you just pitched my idea. Yeah, back but I to did me. it smartly. Okay, like, but, but hold on, wait, hold on. You saw this whole thing. Uh, I said, right so what you're my saying is, eyes. is this how it works with Sarah? Because I, I would love to. Okay, <sighs> well, oh, that, <laughs> that's going to take a bit longer. Hold on, and that costs on, about four fifty an hour. Okay? You, Danny, just, no, I just, like, I just don't understand you what just, straddle. No, no, and then Dan oh, said, because, I don't do straddle. Well, hold on a second, and then Danny said, okay, and then you looked at your machine. Talk to me, Dan. I talked about buying a put. Kidding. For for no, you said either. But you were saying either way. Either way. If you're bullish. 
buy the call, the 413. But my point is, is like buying them both and just hoping that we have a huge oh, move one way or another. Okay. That's okay. what you're doing when you're buying a straddle. When I understand. you're buying a call, well, you're hoping it goes up more than the price of the call. Thank you. You're buying a put, you're hoping that it goes down By the way, the BLT, the bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. Just yeah. In case God, you're you're that's from hey, a you know, bacon, bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. We haven't our fabulous guest either. Not well, even I was a, waiting even for happen. that. No, we're going to do that. Yeah, but, um, but yeah. I was, I, we were going to set that up. Yeah, but just, you know, in that conversation with Stephanie Rule, who is the host of the 11th Hour, sure. we talk about a whole host of things. The debt ceiling, that could get kind of funky yep. in May, too, right? And right. we talk, there's a lot of we stuff. We said the stock market's not the economy, and she tries to help people on air. You know what? Realize it? You know what? You're bringing that up because you said that, and she said, you know, I really like that you made that point, Danny. Well, yeah, we talked about a lot of stuff. Yeah, we talked about a lot of stuff. We're going <laughs> to tease that later, but uh, just, to, just to get that in there. I was going to say, um, in the college, I had to take a class called Poetry Drama. Fascinating class. Well, it wasn't poetry and drama? No, just poetry drama. Uh, any Robert Frost fans here? No. I am. We've used that title already. I know, but it all <laughs> leads to this. Yeah. And I'm just going to set it up a little bit for you. All right, I'm ready. As dawn gives up today, nothing gold can stay. Except, as it turns out, the F and gold market. Oh, let's go, guy. Oh, now we're together. High five. Off to the races. There it is. As sure we is. sit here, there yeah. it is. gold has been ra- gold gets it. Gold understands. Central banks, I have said this, Danny Moses, they understand what they've done. They're hedging their ineptitude. China is buying gold every single month. Last year, 2022, central banks bought 1,131 tons, $70 billion worth of gold. A record amount. Guess what? They're doing it again now. Gold is about to get through the all-time highs. Gold is on a collision course with a new big figure. And when I say new big figure, I ain't messing around. I'm talking about a three number in front of the three zeros. Because when hedge funds and real investors start getting involved, as Eddie Murphy said in the great movie, uh, I believe, Coming not not coming to America. It was the golden child. Oh, yeah. No floor here, Monty. Well, there ain't no ceiling here in the gold market. Listen, it's it. People are now buying gold miners. Look at those yes. stocks because now. Yes. Is, is this just about the dollar though, Danny? No. No. Whoa. No. Oh, it's not. you you did that to piss me off. I did. Yeah. I because did. we I had a television I, show I, I a couple weeks ago, and it. somebody said, this, "All this is is a dollar." No, it's very, part of it. Very Let me give a dismissively, by the way. Let me give yes. a let me give a a little bit of a Bitcoin Ethereum shout. I mean, those things are fire. Are those things fire are, are moving? Those things. You know, the only person who owns them anymore in my household is my daughter, my nineteen year old. She held. She was. She, she was held. Hodled. She, she hodled. She yeah. hodled. Um, let let's. <laughs> but listen, yeah. Danny's right. Yeah. The miners are starting to. Sh- they're absolutely starting, and, you're and right. they have underperformed the underlying commodity for a long time. Watch the catch up there, and quickly since we're on the subject. Earlier this week, we saw news out, and I don't think Exxon spoke about it or even acknowledged it, but ExxonMobil supposedly had interest in Pioneer Natural. So yeah. Pioneer is the largest, one of the largest fracking shale place. First of all, no way this current administration would let that. It's not going to happen, I don't think. Second of all, this would probably be about a 65 to $70 billion deal, which Exxon could do. But that's got nothing to do with it. The fact that these companies, the news is out there, and these energy companies have the wherewithal, and we're in that kind of environment, I think speaks volumes as to the underlying strength of the energy sector, Danny Moses. Yeah, fundamentally, it's probably the strongest it's out there. So again, we'll see the quarters. We're going to see how strong these companies look. And we said at the beginning of the year, there's going to be M&A, and that's the sector it's going to be in. And if you're an investment banker, and you're looking through your sector, you're like, what, where are we going to generate revenue from in the bank? It's in the energy sector. It's the, quote, healthiest of them all. So I think we'll continue to see that no matter where oil is. And so, Well, so really interesting guy. Just explain this one time for um, mm-hmm. our audience here. So we talked about it on Fast Money last night. We are talking about the technicals in crude oil, and we've spent a lot of time oh, talking yes. about a recession, whether it's going to come. Is it going to be long? Is it going to be deep? Is it going to be you know, shallow? Is it gonna even going to happen? And so you got the question, um, how can crude go from, it just went from 65 to 83, um, and it looks like if it breaks out, if it were to break out, and again, maybe this is a function of the dollar weakness and all that sort of stuff, but how can we have a recession here in crude oil? You know, going Go on its way to ninety or hundred or something like that. Because again, you know, it seems counterintuitive, but you got to you got to. There's supply demand imbalances still. We're at po- we're at pre COVID levels in terms of demand. Now you'll say demand's going to destruct, not necessarily. Number two, look at quietly what's going on with the price of gasoline. 
in this country. Nobody's talking about it because it doesn't behoove anybody. Gas is at levels we haven't seen in eight or nine months. Very quietly, gasoline going higher. We're coming into the summer driving season. Refiners, guess what? We haven't made a new refinery in this country since the early 1970s. They're at max capacity. The underlying commodities can go higher in a slowing economy. That's All it comes down to is supply-demand imbalances, which have been there all along, and we're starting to see it. We're seeing it in energy, and to a certain extent, it's completely different, but home builders as well. Yeah. Those stocks have done extraordinarily well against the backdrop where it makes zero sense, other than the fact is you still have supply-demand imbalances. So, so, Danny, this comes at a time where, obviously, it's a big input cost. Um, you saw what the airlines just had to say here. Are these guys good at hedging oil? I mean, like, like you, know, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, So yeah. my, my point is, is, like, crude could go higher, and it could be just a wrecking ball for, like, an economy that's on the tilt. I just want to hit a couple things here, you, you know. Uh, the macro Alf, that's um, yeah. Alfonso uh, Pecatiello. Yeah. He's been on our pod before, well done. and he's really good. Um, and on April 10th, he tweeted, I expect the U.S. to be in a recession by June. Go look at um, all the comments in there. It's kind of oh, interesting, boy. lots of trolley sort of stuff. But you pointed this out. Our friend Tony Dwyer, also friend of the pod, um, and I want I want, to, I want your take on this, Danny, because you've known Tony really well. We've all known Tony for a long time, but he's over at Canaccord Genuity. And he's made this case on Fast Money. He's made it on our podcast recently. Um, we recently found um, out how quickly and aggressively liquidity and the need for money can affect the financial system and markets. The current, number one, U.S. Uh, Treasury Yield Curve Inversions, Conference Board of Leading e Economic Indicators, conf uh, Commercial and Industrial Lending Standards, and how the uh, Employment Trends Index are all at levels associated with lower uh, being in a near recession since 1957. The SPX has never made the low before a recession even began. So the low in the S&P was in October, mm -hmm. right? Um, we are up now um, considerably from that. We're up 8% on the year. Talk to me about all those things that he's put together. And he had a great note out of this. And we'll the one I care most about, which I don't have in front of me, is the Employment Trends yeah. Index. Is that what it's called? Yeah. The ETI. Yeah. And that we track various buckets. And I think five of whatever are now turned negative. And when that happens and it goes to minus one or whatever ratio is using, that's the thing that's going on right now. And that's why inflation is slowing because the Fed is – has doing their job to a degree. It comes at a cost. It's not just about taming inflation. What does that come with? It's a slowing economy. We've seen a rise in jobless claims. We've seen this start to occur. It's not gigantic, but the trend has definitely mm -hmm. reversed. The same way that inflation is trending higher, on a, uh, the same way that inflation is trending lower, economic data is starting to trend lower as well. And so, listen, Tony's always been very good, and he, he's, he speaks to the facts. And he'll take the facts, and it's not subjective. I believe it's objective. And I used to give him shit because 99, not 99%, most of the time he's bullish, but his <laughs> tactical calls have always been good. This is something different. You could, he could be wrong about this for a day or a week. We've seen what the market can do, make you know smart people look stupid. How you doing? Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm even smart, but, but, the, but the, point is that, the point is that things like that are the long-term things that matter. Those trends don't yeah. just reverse. No. They don't just change on a dime. So thanks for pointing that out, and I think it's a worthwhile All note. Right, let's Tony do a favorite. couple things before we get out of here. Um, so pre-market on Monday, okay, is Charles Schwab. We spent a lot of time talking about um, Schwab, and the stock is barely budged, Danny. It's trading like 52 bucks yeah, yeah, or yeah. something like that. Um, thoughts Sell a there. Straddle. Sorry, I'm just joking. Oh, my goodness. Well, hold on one second. No, I know what I'm yeah. It's interesting you because in my mind, <laughs> when Danny said buckets, I'm sitting here saying, well, Charlie Bucket, of course, from Willy Wonka and the Charcoal course, Family, yeah. who was played by Jack Albertson, who was also in Chico and the Man. But right. I wasn't going to say that because right. but you, you don't did. Like, I only did it because you mentioned Charles Schwab. So once you said Charles, oh I'm like, well, God. I got to mention yeah. All right. All right. You, so, you set so, me so, off. So I want to have less in Gobstopper, Daddy. <laughs> Go ahead. Th yeah. Thoughts there because is it like of all of the names that we've talked about, it seems like that is the one. I want on, the like, world. I want the whole world. That's great. I want job you wrapped all up you. in my pocket. It's my bar of chocolate. Gene Wilder. Give it to me now. Was it, I don't think people yeah. understand the genius of Gene, Gene Wilder. Genius. All right. I have no opinion on Schwab here. What's going to happen is that. Um, the CEO Bettinger yeah. is going to be coached now on what he should be saying yeah. versus what he was blurting out like two or three weeks ago. So they have prided them, they have prided themselves on the fact that they haven't lost deposits. But what's gone on in this last month is that investors and consumers are being educated mm -hmm. that it takes a phone call or a click to basically change your yield from 0.4 percent to four percent, right? Yeah. Little on dime. So Schwab will say we haven't lost. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's fine. But your net interest income and your NIM are going right. to suffer as a result of that. That's fine. The one thing that no one is accounting for, and Schwab stock will 
be okay on the margin if they're not forced to raise capital. And we'll, we could talk about the held to maturity versus available for sale and all that shit that goes on. I do believe they will have to raise capital. Is that we've had a stock market that's buoyed it. Because let's not kid ourselves. Charles Schwab, the most important input yeah. of all the things that people would look at from a macro basis are equity values. Yeah. Because their assets are dependent on where the stock market. So you tell me, Dan, if the market, I would think the stock has massively underperformed in the sense of what this market has done, I believe, right? It's And, and it's probably accurately priced right now if people believe that they're going to kind of get through this and back to kind of, well, I'm, I'm not yeah. putting bullet, but yeah. four to 450 in earnings potentially next year. And yeah. it's not, but I think there's going to be some rocky road ahead. It'll be very interesting quarter. Just, sure. to, just to be really clear. So yep. your point about the net interest margin. So if people are moving from the 0.4% account to the 4% account, and you think about that contraction and net interest margins, there's no amount of trading by that um, by those customers that's going to make up for that. 4X, but, 400X. And, right, so, so the point really very clearly is, is like they are so much more exposed to a, a, like a money center bank that has all these other businesses. And like, all right, so guy, for you, I like, Thursday, oh, like pre-market. Blackstone. Okay, so when we're talking about what's on the other side of this situation, we talk about uh, commercial real estate yeah. exposure, and we talk about um, you know credit defaults, and we've already seen some of that. Okay, we've seen the gates that they put up. Um, this is going back to the fall. This is one I think that's on your radar. This is Thursday pre-open. It has to be. I mean, you've seen bounces in the stock a few times over the last couple months, but if you look at it, and I'm sure you probably have it up on your fact set machine, it's really gone nowhere. I mean, we have bounced yeah. off the lows, but... It's not like it's performing all that well. And they're, I don't want to say skeletons in the closet because that's the wrong phrase, but they obviously have some issues they have to work through. I mean, when the real estate, commercial real estate market was humming along, that stock participated like no other financial to the upside. When things started to go pear-shaped, specifically when Fed started raising rates and then the subsequent move in some of these things, that stock got cut in half. And it hasn't really recovered all that much. So, yeah, you got to watch it. But for the life of me, like many of these companies, I can't see what they could possibly say that's encouraging. Let me just say this. One of the greatest business models, this private equity, right? You're talking about 10-year locked up money that's going to have a management fee whether you like it or not, right? So there are there is a consistent mm -hmm. part of that earning stream that people are willing to pay for, right? So great business model in that sense. I, I think it would take something. I'm not long or short the stock. I think it would take something on Blackstone that we're not seeing yet. And I don't think there's anything like that right now to really force the stock a lot lower. That being said, yeah. dead money, I think, at best. But think about what you guys just did. You just brought up two more financials. You could have picked anything. Of yeah. The companies are going to well, I have one. One more. Okay, but you chose Schwab and Blackstone. And again, it's so ingrained in our economy, yeah. these companies. It touches well, everything. I think, you know, yeah. if you're listening to this pod, you know, one of the things what we're trying to do is, like, like all of us are focused on what lies beneath here. And I think those are two really interesting names that could be the next leg of this, like, financial crisis that we experience that's largely contained to regional banks. And the way the regional banks have traded since a handful of them have failed or backstopped is really bad. So to us, it's like it makes sense to extrapolate what are the next ones that might have problems, and that's why we're focused on these. All right, last one here on single names, then we got to get out of here in a second here. Um, Tesla, Wednesday after the close, we already know what their Q1 deliveries were. One thing I think is really interesting is that they just announced another price cut, okay? So right now, they're cutting prices in all their major markets here. You know, I've read a bunch of the bulls. They think that this 86 consensus, uh, 86 cents consensus for Q1 is really potentially very light and it could be 96 or a dollar something like that so we know that they kind of were up sequentially four percent year over year in their deliveries but it was below consensus for deliveries we know that the prices are going to be a lower price point so that means there's going to be margin pressure i don't know how if you're looking at a consensus estimate on facts that of 86 cents for the quarter everything we know there that you're <laughs> that so you, for the that folks, you're gonna have a higher number folks oh, can, I, actually it. some people can see this because we yeah. put it Danny is contorting like his like his, <laughs> the it's amazing. No, like, I didn't know we you, were going to get to breathe. this today. Well, why so. wouldn't we? But it, it's, it's reporting you know, again, next week, and, and and I just want to say this: I yeah. still think this is one of the worst looking charts in the entire stock That's fine. market. But let's forget all that. Forget the chart. Yeah, it is a consumer sensitive name. Yeah. The economy is going to slow. There's no way around it. It's trading at what fifty to sixty times earnings at this point. I don't even know what the two. It doesn't even matter. Is the point? So it is what it is. Let's see what the numbers that they put up. But you're right, Dan. It, you can forecast a lot of it, but they can mess around on the margin with what they actually report. So.
All right. We should we do see. this? All right, listen. So here's here's the deal, right? So you guys are with us. We appreciate um, the, the listenership. We appreciate you guys who are um, starting to watch this on our YouTube channel. So go to Risk Media. We yeah. So how you, how yeah, you, how right. you, how you yeah. doing, Yankees? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so check us out there. Subscribe to that, people. We got a lot of content. Smash there. the shit out of the like Smash button. Smash it. Um, so listen, this week, oh, like you know, that. we've been doing this pod for what two and a quarter years now. Um, and most of our guests over the last year have been uh, market strategists, investors, analysts, and that sort of thing. And so um, some journalists, but 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 primarily in the financial market. So Steph Rule, um, who's the host of 11th Hour and MSNBC, um, some of you guys watch MSNBC, some of you guys would never watch MSNBC. Um, we try to kind of leave every once in a while, I kind of get a little political thing in here or that. Listen, we're, we're, we're people, you know, and, and we have um, lots of thoughts and views about stuff or whatever. And sometimes it comes out and sometimes it's going to be things that you guys don't agree with. Um, but, you know, we hear everyone in a while. For every one of you guys who sends us a text or a tweet or an email says shut up and dribble, you know, that sort of thing. We have 10 people who say, you know, like. Good on you. Okay, so we have a conversation with Stephanie Rule. Um, she's actually the least political of all of us as we're having this conversation. So if you think that you're just here um, for the markets and, and the commentary like that, and you don't want to hear maybe some views that don't agree that you don't agree with politically, then click off now. I mean, we appreciate you being here. We're not trying to alienate anybody. And, and I know that, you know, Danny, you might not have wanted to have this conversation or you might not have, but Steph is a friend of ours. Um, she started out as a banker for years. Yeah. You did business with her. Yeah. Um, she went over to Bloomberg and became, I think, an ace financial journalist over there after no media training or anything like that. And now she's been doing general news, covering a whole host of things. And it just so happens that a lot of it's been politics. I have strong political views, okay? A lot of people who follow me on Twitter or my old Twitter handle, they know that or watch on Fast Money. We try to leave a bunch of it out here. So just thoughts here, guys, because we wanted to have this little conversation really quickly. We don't want to piss any of you guys off. We appreciate all of you. You go, guy. It's never our intention to upset anybody. And we and the conversation, and I hope you stick around and listen to it, I actually thought it was a very thoughtful conversation. Obviously, some political stuff comes up without question. I mean, the mar the the current condition that we live in is extraordinarily polarized. So by definition, if 100 people listen, I'm sure we are going to upset 50 or so of those people. But that's not our intention to upset anybody. But we hope you listen, and we hope you glean something from it I as mean, well. listen, it's important, and how it correlates to the show is the following. When you have a debt ceiling situation with a broken Washington, you better be prepared for shit hitting the fan. Mm -hmm. You better understand what that means. And to me, if you can kind of conjoin those, I mean, that's the ideal right person. But listen... Uh, she's an incredible person. She's extremely bright. I mean, she replaced Brian Williams, which is very tough to do, right? Who yeah. But, and, and so anyway, point is that she's great. She was one of our first guests that we had yeah. when we started on the tape pod. So take a listen. Well, I think it'll be well, very listen, important. Well, listen, the last thing I just say about this is, like, we started this podcast over two years ago because we wanted to give our listeners or the people who wanted more than just sound bites on CNBC. And Guy and I love doing that. And, Danny, you're coming on today. We love that medium. It's fun. It's it, Hopefully it's informative. Hopefully it can be, um, you know, entertaining to some or whatever. We wanted to do longer-form conversations. We wanted to do the sort of conversations that we have with the people in our lives that help inform the you know the things that we do in the markets or professionally in general. Steph is one of those people. She's as smart as anyone we've ever had on this show, but it did bring out some political stuff that you might not agree with. And I'll just make one last point here, and then we're done. Um, you know, listen, we get things from, hey, I'm out. I didn't want to hear Nathan on this, that, or whatever. You know, listen, like, we, we can – Try to separate some of this stuff is what I'm saying. Okay, so like I think we probably overdid that a little bit. I know guys ready to get the heck out of here. Danny, Danny, you ready to get the I'm heck out of go. here? Ready to go. Going on fast money. I don't know what I'm going to say. Danny at this doesn't point, wear a t-shirt, by the way, which is really upsetting. I don't to wear me. a t-shirt. You I wear a t-shirt every like single day. What okay. are you talking about? All right. When what? we when we come back, the aforementioned conversation with Stephanie Rule.